guess we have a strange collection of entities on the stage now who <laughs> came in from the latest portal opening. <laughs> All right, um, so we can really get the ball rolling. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with uh, everybody's credentials. Uh, you've got some information um, uh, from the program and, and also before they speak, some of them uh, are coming up. Uh, today and tomorrow, uh, but I will introduce who they are, and uh, we have here five outstanding researchers uh, with many years logged in the field in all kinds of things, paranormal, encrypted, uh, and alien, and um, starting with uh, Ron Murphy right here um, to my uh, left, um, and then we have uh, Lyle Blackburn. Now, this is Ron's first time here. Very glad to see him here. Uh, David Weatherly and Ron and I were all at a Bigfoot event recently where we barely got to talk to each other because it was such a monsoon. Uh, so uh, glad to have the chat time here, Ron Murphy. And uh, then to his left, Lyle Blackburn returning uh, to Mothman after an absence. Uh, very glad to see Lyle back. And another first timer, David Weatherly, very good friend of mine. Uh, cryptids, black-eyed kids, uh, black-eyed people, strange intruders, gin. Uh, David and I often walk uh, a lot of the same territory in our research. Steve Ward, someone I have known for many years. Uh, he's part of the Mothman Irregulars, a group I formed some years ago of dedicated Mothman researchers. He's going to be talking about high strangers tomorrow. Uh, he spends so much time in this area, I'm surprised, uh, surprised your wife hasn't let you move here. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely your second home. And uh, then Bill Brock, who's also uh, been uh, at this festival before, very good investigator of many things strange and unusual. So uh, we have some uh, microphones set up. Um, uh, do we have microphones for the audience? How are people? Okay. So um, what, what I'm going to do is just ask a couple of questions to sort of get the ball rolling. And then we invite questions from the audience. Uh, and um, uh, there's some microphones up here. Uh, I know sometimes you kind of have to shout if uh, somebody way in the back has a question, then I'll repeat it for the microphone so that uh, everybody can hear. Okay, gentlemen, uh, I know that we have uh, on our panel um, varying uh, personal views on whether or not cryptids and unknown uh, entities are interdimensional or something that's really of the earth, might be more flesh and blood. And um, I'm not going to have uh, us go down the line, so I'm just going to throw this over to whoever wants to take it and how many of you want to take it. <clears throat> and uh, the microphones by, right here in front should pick everybody up, so we won't need to pass anything uh, down. But regardless of your thoughts of flesh and blood versus interdimensional, uh, what are your thoughts on the existence of interdimensional portals? and uh, how we might explain them uh, in terms of the activity we see. Anyone want to take that? Bill, go ahead. I guess me, because uh, I'll be talking about portals tomorrow at 2 o'clock, so be here to listen to me talk about this stuff. Uh, so portals, so I, at the end of the day, portals are just not mathematically possible. I hate the first few bubbles, but it's just not math. It, it just doesn't add up. But uh, what does add up is uh, the crossing over of other dimensions. I, I've talked about this today to a few people. So Einstein and some other people had this theory that um, everything is going on right now. So there's no past or future, it's only right now. And because our minds can only understand things in a linear fashion, it just seems as though there's a past and a future, but truly there isn't. And so people think that uh, what we're seeing in these portals are, are, are basically us just understanding that there's something else out there the same space that we are. So that's uh, been kind of what I've been learning about the past year or so that I've been investigating these portals and, and if they are real or even possible. But uh, I don't believe, as far as the math goes, that a real portal is possible. I, I grew up uh, believing that you know, Bigfoot was the thing for me when I was growing up. And I always assumed that it was a flesh and blood creature because it made sense to me. You know, and, uh, you can find footprints, sometimes you can find places where it ate or slept or whatever. Uh, but I've, I've been researching now for around 40 years, uh, and, and things just aren't making sense from a completely corporeal uh, position. So I'm leaning more towards the idea of an interdimensionality. 
Um, and I think when we talk about that, we have to bring up the idea uh, of a portal, of, of the way in which something can go from one side to another. Um, and, and, and I do believe that the opening up of a portal or a, a wormhole is indeed possible. And I know what Bill had said about not being mathematically possible, but then again, I think everybody up here will agree that not everything can be you know, calculated through uh, conventional math and science. Yeah, I, I have to respectfully disagree with you too. It may be a matter of semantics, but um, you know, a lot of my background is studying the tribal cultures around the world. And what I have found is that so much that these people talk about and have talked about for their entire tribal history is just now coming to light in, you know, in terms of science in the last few years. And it's kind of laughable to me when you know, an ancient culture like the Chinese talk about the human energy field and they're convinced that it exists. And then, what, 10 years ago, science probably you know, finally said, oh, hey, we've proven there's a human energy field. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the same thing is true, I think, for portals, you know, consistently around the world, I have found these tribal tales about openings that go from one place to another. And like I said, it may be semantics, but I, I, I definitely believe that there are these crossing points for these things. Yeah, I think that it's just, uh, for me, the word portal isn't, uh, isn't right for what we're dealing with. Uh, it's something else. It's not a true portal. Because a portal, and if you can imagine like a piece of paper, and you put a dot on this corner of the paper, and a dot on this corner, and you fold it over, the, the distance between the two dots is much closer. And so that's essentially what a portal is, is a bending of space and time. So in order to bend space and time, it requires so much energy. Literally, planets would implode if this happened. So what we're dealing with is probably something much different, something that doesn't require that much energy to create. Right. What, happens if, yeah, what happens if we don't use the word portal and we use the word doorway? Right. And I think that makes or a window, sense. Window, or window, 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 that's right. Yeah. Um, you know, we're going to be celebrating Halloween here in a pretty short period of time. And the idea of Sawa, you know, the, the idea of what the Celts knew, that this was a time whenever the uh, veil between this world and the other world yeah. was at its thinnest. And uh, the cultures all over the world that at certain times during the year, we can perceive or enter or cross over into that other world. And, and we can come in contact with the other. So I think the idea of a portal, uh, kind of a sci-fi type of definition, isn't what we're talking about here, but the occasional doorway opening up to allow us to see or other things to enter our world. But again, it's semantics. Because, it is. You know, it is. We're dealing with things that we're wrestling to right. understand and trying to bend our current concepts of science around those things as well. There are some compelling stories. Uh, Paul Eno, researcher Paul Eno, talks about a couple that told him about uh, uh, them stepping into elsewhere. They were out uh, in Utah looking for ghost towns, and they found a place where there were people, there were cars that seemed to be electric cars, they spoke a different language, they didn't, uh, didn't like the money when they tried to pay for their food at a restaurant. Very, very compelling story. And there are other stories. There's a, around the turn of the century, there was a story of a, uh, a boy that had showed up on a doorstep with three fingers on each hand and just very kind of different body structure. <coughs> eventually died. This was in France around the turn of the century. So, of course, some of these stories are probably folklore, but some very, very compelling stories about people that have at least temporarily gone somewhere else and then come back to tell the tale. As a follow-up question panel, uh, what might you think would open a portal? I just got done speculating on some of this in my own presentation, but I'd like your thoughts on what are some of the factors that might cause a, one of these doorways to open? Um, okay, I'll start first. <laughs> so, uh, so basically there's this cat named Alistair Crowley. I don't know if you guys know who he is or not, but he has been known to be the most evil man on the planet. So back in uh, early 1900s, he says that he opened a portal and let this little creature out named Lamb, L-A-M, you guys can Google that if you want to. <laughs> and anyway, so the Lamb comes through this portal and uh, hangs out, has a beer with Crowley, and they kind of talk a little bit, and they t this thing tells Crowley that it's from a different place, you know, and, and so, make a long story short, Crowley draws a picture of this thing, and it looks just like a gray. It looks identical to a gray alien. Who knows where he got this picture from or, or if it was even true, but everything after that point to now seems to be based on 
this picture here. Um, whether that's just out of coincidence or if he actually opened a portal and let this thing in, I don't know. I have no idea. But I do know that Alistair Crowley says he opened a portal and he says that he had a conversation with this thing and he drew a picture and it looks exactly what everybody else says that crazy. I'm curious, <coughs> Crowley also said that he opened a portal at Loch Ness. Yeah, that's the Loch Ness monster. And that's what led to the Loch Ness monster cycle. Absolutely. So, you know, you go back again to the, the older tribal traditions and uh, their focus seems to be on the fact that there are certain points around the earth where these things are, are possible. Places that are, you know, where the veil is thinner, so to speak, or where something, uh, whether it's geological or, or what it is, has caused a, a certain point to be an open and an access to these other levels of existence. Rosemary just mentioned, uh, and I had not considered it before, uh, meteor strikes in connection with these uh, these human applying humanoids over Chicago. Tomorrow I'll be talking about a high strangers area in Washington State that uh, Sally Shepard Wolford has written about in a book called Valley of the Skook. And uh, the, you know, it's a three ring circus of men in black, Bigfoot, UFOs, very strange circumstances. But uh, they were investigating in about 1950. There was a large meteor strike in the area, which was about the size of a baseball field. So I had not really connected that before to the possibility of kind of shaking things up there and making the air thin, so to speak. Yeah, I, I consider myself a historian. I have a graduate degree in history. Um, and I will be talking about uh, waiting the entities of the fairy realm here in a couple hours at 6 o'clock. Um, and, and I was able to take a, a cross cultural look at various ideas of these types of flying entities around the world. And I think that I can provide a little bit of, of rather tantalizing evidence on the ideas of portals, uh, geologically speaking. So we're not talking about something opening up randomly, but there are certain parts around the world that just have uh, a natural opening to them, whether it's certain times of the year under certain elemental conditions. But uh, I hope you stay around for that and give me some feedback. Wow, are you into the portals? <laughs> <laughs>
magnetic fields come here from the sun and our magnetic fields cross, they cause what they call a portal and they can actually map uh, and see energy moving in and out of these portals. They have no idea where it goes or even where it's there. So anyway, they recently did this test where they stuck a bunch of magnetic fields together and created what they said was a black hole in the lab. So going back to uh, Einstein's theories and his uh, field notes, which is an equation, um, when you solve that equation, it ends up proving that a black hole is real. And then, like I said, if a portal is real, it can only exist through a wormhole. And so if that's true, the equation actually solves the problem of a wormhole. Make a long story short, Einstein said it's possible, so like, it's possible through my Einstein. Maybe it's possible, but they're definitely creating these stuff in the lab, and it's definitely happening because two magnetic fields. So who knows? It could have done something. I don't know. But you gotta, you gotta look at it this way. There's a lot of stuff we don't know the answers to, and like if you look back, uh, you know, an early man, you're kind of thinking, wow, they they saw lightning. What did they think of that? They didn't understand any of the science behind any of that. And someday, in the far future, they're going to look back at us and go, man, they didn't understand any of that. And, you know, what's proven then uh, will be, you know, such a leap ahead of where we're at. So we always got to remember that we don't really know everything. And, and we're sort of in, still in a fog, even though we've come so far uh, with the knowledge of science and everything else we know, there's still way, you know, distance to go. And that's why we're all here, right? I mean, we're all here because at the end of the day, we're always going to be left with a question. I <clears throat>